How do you know a story is great? Wow, how do I know a story is great? That's a good question. I have to trust my instincts and my gut. I think uh, for me, spending a childhood and a high school years and college years watching lots and lots and lots of movies gave me a film language that I think uh, allows me to spot a good story. Um, I've seen so many really good movies and so many bad movies um, and read so many scripts and so many bad scripts that uh, I think the experience of that uh, kind of indoctrinated me to spotting something when it's special. Um, I think if you, the longer you walk in the wilderness, the easier it is to spot a forest or water, I think. And so for me, I have a very in-depth film language from having watched endless black and white movies from the 30s and 40s and 50s. So I think that, I mean, I've just watched every movie on the AFI 100, for example. Um, so I think that helps. I think it also helps me recognize something that's too similar to something or, oh, well, that's an homage to, and you know, okay. And either, either they've done it well or they haven't done it well. Um, and I, you know, there's certain filmmakers like Billy Wilder who, uh, who I would love to pattern my directing career after, who I admire so deeply. And so I think, you know, following their instincts and reading what they did, what they thought, um, I think informs my decisions as well. How do you know if a script is ready for financing? Wow, that's a great question. How do I know a script is ready for financing? Um, I gotta pay bills. I mean, the truth is, I think it's, you know, it's real subjective and I think it's instinct because the truth is, uh, you know, if you're in an editing room, you could edit forever. There's no end to when it, you, need a, you need a delivery date. Delivery date informs, and I think pressures and forges the best movie you can make during that time. Uh, it's not open-ended. And I think the same is true with screenplays. I think the better screenplays are the ones that have to be made within a time frame. And so at a certain point, you have to sort of say, okay, this is the best we're going to do to go get the financing right now. We can't play with this for another year. Now is the time. This move, this this has sort of reached the time when it's either we're not going to make it, we're not going to send it out, or it's ready. And um, I tended to, I think, I tended to have a reputation of sending in scripts to networks when I was in the television movie business as a producer that I could get behind. So I would not send it in, much to the chagrin of screenwriters, often until I thought I could defend it. And if I couldn't defend it, um, then I would have the writer do more work. And if I could defend it, then I would send it in. And there were a rare occasion where the writer would do no more work and was unwilling to, to fix it. And, uh, and I think I scored a lot of points because I would tell the network my candid feelings. So I wouldn't send something in as a lot of my competitors do and say everything's brilliant. Um, I would send something in if it, the writer hadn't done the work um, and say, look, uh, this is not in good shape. I'm sending it to you because I I can't get the writer to do any more work, but um, this isn't ready yet. I, normally, I wouldn't show this to you. So you you are a believer in multiple drafts of notes and revisions, things like that. Oh, screenplays are not written; they are rewritten. The best screenplays have been rewritten and rewritten. There is no such thing as a brilliant first draft that goes to screen, unless maybe you're David Kelly, but. Uh, I mean, that's no movies are rewritten, not written. Uh, all of the, the the problems in the script get solved in rewriting. All of the character issues get solved in rewriting. All of the production issues get solved in rewriting. You don't want to throw money at a problem. You want to solve it on the page. So uh, yeah, I'm a really big believer in yes, multiple drafts. And then there's you know there's again the draft that gets your movie ordered. And then there's the draft that you shoot. And those are not the same. And then by the time it makes it to the editing and it's on the it's timeline, it's the it's script. Thing. Yeah, it's, yep. it's totally different. It's a different beast, yep. And so is that one thing that you tell your students is to not be so precious with whatever was the final version of the script versus <laughs> what? Well, I, my, I have producing students, not screenwriters. Well, I have screenwriters as well, but primarily I'm, I'm teaching producers. and. Uh, I critique their stuff pretty strongly when they pitch in my class. So they don't have a choice. They can't be precious in my class. Do you also teach them to have tough skin, to, to, to thick yeah, skin? Yeah, I, I, uh, there's a 10 commandments uh, that I teach them on pitching. And uh, one of them is uh, be strong, but 
take a punch. You know, the truth is you want to be back in that room again. So even if they're passing, you want that experience to be positive. So, you know, even if they're saying no, find you know, a good moment in that meeting so that when you call back again a year from now and you got another project, they don't go, Ay, that was the guy that fought with us. Um, so I think you want to make sure that any pitching experience is a good experience for both people, whether you sell or not. And the truth is, you know, you're not going to sell most of what you know, you only need you can get 99 no's as long as you get one yes. So the truth is, you've got to be resilient. You've got to get up off the mat. And I think that is, I think there are producers that are better at that than talented. And that's their skill, is that they just are relentless. And it doesn't matter how many people say no, they just keep going. They don't care. They have, they're able to just get knocked down and get back up and take a punch from Mike Tyson and get back up and take another punch from Mike Tyson and get back up. Um, I'm not that resilient. Uh, I, I take, you know, I take passes a little more personal, less so now than I did in my early in my career. But yeah, well, I, I had to learn how to have a tough skin. But if you if you're if you definitely can't handle no, then you're in the wrong business. Well, going back to Rain Man, you were told initially no, and then you you kept going, and obviously that worked. Yeah, with Rain Man, we pitched it to Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers said we just bought a project similar to this called Forrest Gump from Steve Tisch, and uh, so we're not going to buy your project. And uh, then we went out and pitched it to someone else. And then we pitched it to United Artists and then United Artists said yes. And then there was the long gestation after Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise committed because we went through four directors before we actually ended up making the movie. It was, went through Steven Spielberg and Marty Brest and Sidney Pollack before we ended up at Barry Levinson. So it was like four years of rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and then directors leaving the project before we actually got it made. Why do you think the industry saw it as a, as a competitor to Forrest Gump? Two separate stories. Uh, well, the executive at Warner Brothers saw it as similar because it was about uh, a mentally challenged person, whether they were simple or actually truly autistic and savant, autistic savant, as Rain Man was. So I think that's why. Um, and they had bought a book. They had paid, apparently, a pretty penny for the book with Steve Tisch, and so they just decided they didn't want to develop. No, the irony is, um, and I'm sure people at Warner Brothers don't forget, um, that Forrest Gump got made at Paramount and Rayman got made at United Artists and they both won Best Picture. And neither, both got pitched at Warner Brothers and both got passed at Warner Brothers. They developed the script in Forrest Gump and then didn't make it and then they passed on the idea of Rayman. 